And I had the time of my life. And I never felt this way before. <laughs> Dude, that was a Swayze hit back in the day. Absolutely. Dude, did you uh did you see that they're they're uh that uh they're the did you see the remake of that? No. God awful, dude. I, not, I kind of assumed. Yeah, they're not making many good remakes these days. Although I did see another <laughs> or new stuff. Yeah, yeah dude. <laughs> I saw this I saw this preview on uh, <clears throat> I think it was like Apple TV or something like that and had Idris Elba and he was like uh he was on a plane, right? And um and uh he looks like he's some I don't know, plain dude that uh, like a sky marshal or whatever the hell those things right. are called, right? And then, and then while he's on there, uh, th- there's terrorists on the plane, which I was like, huh, that sounds a lot like Passenger Fifty Seven with Wesley <laughs> Snipes. And I looked yeah. it up. I was like, oh, the, the remake, same exact movie. Yeah. This, is, this one's called this one's called Hostage or Hostile it's, Hijack. No, it's called Hijack. I was like, oh, okay. The plot twist is there's snakes on it. Now. <laughs> 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 it's passenger fifty seven with snakes. <laughs> fifty seven snakes on a plane. <laughs> it's just stupid as hell. <laughs> oh, I better not. The first thing uh, I thought. Stop this guy, dude. You got a workout coming up. This oh yeah, I do, yeah. huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah a little yeah. little jog around the block. Yeah, I should be ready to rock and roll for it though. I was I was. Uh, at, when I got back from Disney World, I was a little. Um, I th- well, I don't. I don't think I got sick. I think it was just like change in, in uh, I don't know, elevation and just on a plane and getting out there. So I think my allergies were messing with me. So I was congested, but I'm good to go now. So. Are you worried about it? Thinking you're going to be all jammed up for the no, days? no. Because I mean, this is like you know, uh, two weeks out. It's a good time to get sick, actually, because if you're going to get over it, oh. then, you know, you're over it by the sure. time by the time it gets started. So. So yeah, I should be. I mean, hopefully this isn't our last podcast, though. Yeah, I, I, dude, <laughs> I've told you. I've told you my prediction. That I really hope it's not true. Oh yeah, I already got <clears> past <throat> that though, because I'm 41. So, thank God. Yeah. yeah, we're good. I beat I beat the odds. Yeah, that's so good. okay. Yeah, I, I think we're home free. We got you. We're 41 on, now. <laughs> on that front. <laughs> yeah, good. I think we're good to go. Yeah, you need it, and John are gonna gonna tear it up that's badass yeah it should be pretty Lots good man. Yeah. should be pretty good really cool. I'm looking forward to it I'm looking forward to it so well should, we should uh, we should kind of get into this jump right, right in I think yeah. so um, so today uh, we have a very provocative title for our podcast because I just I just titled it the same title as the documentary Are All Men Ped- Pedophiles which uh, my answer to that is I hope not. Like, <laughs> yeah. like fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess we'll find out yeah. by the end of this podcast if that's the case or not. But Some legit um, clickbait. <laughs> so we tried to. I think based on the, uh, I don't want to call it a shit show, but the last <clears throat> reaction video took us three podcasts to get through. We can't do that this time. So <laughs> yeah. it's like, yeah. damn. So on this one. Um, uh, we what we did was we just took some clips. They're they're roughly uh, two or three minutes a pop, so we'll pay attention to those. Um, and one thing I would say on this is uh, I in the intro I already introduced the um, the the writer and developer of this of this documentary. One thing I would say about this is um, be what be mindful that that they have a pretty heavy accent, right? Even. And like some of the people that they're interviewing, and certainly the narrator has an accent. So um, I don't think it. I don't know if it's inter- a buyer interferes it's a, with the. I mean, I, if it's a buyer beware type situation yeah. or or what. But um, yeah, so we'll. I will. Uh, I'll do my best to get into each one of these, <clears throat> and then uh, yeah, we'll just kind of take a look at each one of them. So, um, but I thought we'd set the stage here with a. Um, uh, I think what we'll do is let's look at uh, the first, like the very first um, uh, introduction. To I, was, it. I was wondering if you're gonna play that. That's yeah, good yeah, idea. yeah. We'll go. F- we'll start there and move forward. Ominous music. Let's start. Here's the damn thing about it. Being a pedophile oh, is wait, this wrong. Is not where I wanted to start. I wanted to start right here. This is where I wanted to start with this girl. 
talking to us. Studies have shown that teen sex is the most searched form of sex on the internet. But this is not surprising because the age at which you find other people attractive does not change. Instead it expands. When we are young, we find children of our own age attractive. But as we grow older, children under the age of 18 do not become less attractive. But pedophiles also find children under the age of 18 attractive. So what is the difference between you and pedophiles? Okay. Okay, so the... Um, the... The... Um, I guess the... The main premise behind what she was just saying there um, she kind of she kind of specified that um, you know your people start finding each other sexually attractive around age 13 and um, and that uh, you know that your 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 attraction or your sexual attraction doesn't change over time it expands mm -hmm. we'll kind of talk a little bit about that um, and that one of the things she highlighted too is teen sex is one of the is is the the most searched you know search term when when looking for pornography, um, and so uh, essentially like she's poses the question sets this up for kind of what we're getting into right I mean I don't know I, what do you think about that just that initial piece that your your sexual attraction doesn't change it expands over time i mean without getting into tmi i'm thinking to myself like I remember when i first started to think girls were cute in my class and it was you know around you know early teenage years and i, I like i definitely wouldn't have found women my age <clears throat> right now at, at 42 i mm -hmm. wouldn't have found women my age attractive yeah and uh I certainly do now i was all you know a, a client asked me a question about this one time and i didn't I didn't fully know how to answer it, and it was kind of a curious question. And I'm, maybe I'll, I'll kind of ask you. So he was asking, he said he lost his virginity around age 15, right? And he and, um, and he had sex with another 15-year-old. Um, it was his girlfriend. And, um, you know, so, you know, it, it's pretty common, I think, if, if, like, guys are going to masturbate, they look back at previous sexual encounters, right? A highlight reel. Yeah, kind of an ESPN highlight reel, and they look da, da, at that. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So now he he was charged with a crime, um, a sex crime, uh, when he was nineteen. So he had that one encounter, and then he had a couple of other encounters, and then when he was nineteen, he uh, I, I think he um, had sex with uh, I think I believe a thirteen year old, and then he was charged. He was in prison. So. Essentially, he had four sexual encounters um, over his entire lifespan but before he came to prison, right? And so he was asking me, so now he's like 23 or 24, and he was asking me, well, so what about, like, uh, what about um, for me, like, not, not me, he's asking, in, in his words, he said, well, so I'm 23 now, and I have some fond memories of when I was hooking up with my girlfriend when I was 15, but she was 15 too. So when I masturbate to that, that's me as a 15 year old masturbating to another 15 year old. Is that deviant? And I was like, Fuck, I don't know. I don't know what. I don't know if to think about that. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I've had clients pose the same question, and I've. He, I don't know if I'm right or wrong on this. Hear me out. I I think intent matters in that. Like, is it? that she's 15 that he finds arousing or is it just the the visual or the memories or whatever the the heightened sexual state that he was in is that what he's finding arousing like is he he's like oh yeah she's a teenager and that's what he's I, if, if i think if it, was, if it was that if it was that he's masturbating to a fantasy and he's attracted because she's 15 that that could be a problem but if it's just a a fond memory is a good time at the time he doesn't have a very big bank of uh, materials to use mm -hmm. and then I don't know I I don't think that's as dangerous uh, yeah de definitely not he was attracted to a 15 year old he was it was definitely more so <clears throat> that he that he was uh, thinking of uh, thinking of the, the interaction between him and her and how much he dug that and, and, and whatnot it was not it had nothing to do with in, her in that case I'd say it's probably pretty normal okay okay cool well I so 
and again, I think people listening to this, you may dis disagree with some of these things. Um, and definitely uh, comment below if you guys have questions. You guys can hit us up on our on our uh, on our podcast, and we we'd like to do a mailbag every now and then, like <laughs> people sending things in, so we can respond directly to those, like people do. But we just don't have any of those. So, all right. So here's our first clip, and this is um, basically this is going to go over age of consent uh, world worldwide, um, average lifespan, birth rate. Um, and kind of the the importance of 16 years old being 16 years old in our in our country has a whole lot to do with um, age of consent. So let's uh, let's take a peek at this and we'll go from there. There is no standard definition for pedophilia because the world cannot agree on one definition. The most confusing factor is the major difference in the legal age of consent. The minimum age at which a heterosexual person is considered legal for sexual acts varies from 9 years to 20 years. Some countries such as Saudi Arabia and Oman do not even have a legal age of consent. But to fully understand this, we need to go back to the beginning. We need to go back in time to the Stone Age. Life was not easy in the Stone Age. The climate was harsh. People had to work hard to have food on the table. They had to hunt for wild animals, dangerous job. They had to gather their food, climb trees to get nuts and seeds. Um, on top of that, there were all kinds of diseases that made the average lifespan of a human being in that period rather low, slightly over 30 years of age. Even worse, in the following period, the period between the Stone and the Bronze Age, the Neolithic, this period even dropped to as low as 20 years of age only. So, with this very short span of life, it means that early modern humans did not have the luxury, like we have today, to postpone having babies. And even though since the Stone Age, the life expectancy has more than doubled, natural selection results in early reproduction because a young age is favorable to a healthy offspring. Anthropological studies conducted by Napoleon Chaillon on primitive societies suggest that the average man finds females around the age of 60 sexually the most attractive. Males have an instinctive preference for females who are at their early ages of sexual maturity. From an evolutionary point of view, this makes perfect sense. A male who can gain sexual access to a young virgin female can maximize his own reproductive potential. Okay, I can't dance much better than that. Yeah. It's fine. yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, so on this, um, the is that is that your timestamp? Yeah. Right there. Okay. So so um, you kind of thought this was kind of an important part about this, like ex explain to everybody kind of what's going on in that clip. Yeah. Sure. So well, first off, the maybe I'm an idiot. It's very possible. But oh, I'm, well, that's it's confirmed. Almost but, certain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it wasn't until maybe a few years ago that I figured out kind of the. So I I, I used to think that you know when you're like you know the lifespan of the Stone Age was like 35 years old or whatever mm -hmm. I was. I was thinking of it at like that, you know, that that's like a, uh, that's considered like old age and that people didn't really live to be in their 50s, 60s, 70s, it, that like 30 years old was where people died. But really the the reason the birth rate, it, it's a infant mortality. Mm -hmm. And so you have a like terrible infant mortality rates. And so, but like. So it's, so it's not just uh, we get to a certain age and we croak early. It's, it's more. Which a bunch of babies that, dying? That kind of makes sense. Like even even nowadays, like there's with modern medicine, like you'll get into the hospital, and I mean, with my kids, I was amazed they gave them to me. Like after they were born, I was like, well, all the stuff you just did, you trust me with that thing? Like you're out of your mind. <laughs> yeah. Me? You yeah. looked at me, and uh, 
but they but even even now like with everything that we have and you're in a hospital with all the resources people still die you know what i mean not nearly as much as they were but i mean damn people back then had to been croaking left and right like parents and children oh know? yeah for sure yeah for sure uh and like because of that it's uh it, it's adaptive to be able to reproduce sooner and in you know so like if you were a reproductive age so you know 12 13 14 that you know it, it, during the course of your lifespan in the stone age you, you're gonna have a lot there's gonna be a lot of death and so it, the, the reproduction it was advantageous to start at a young age because you know by the time I mean I don't know I don't know how many I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows how many kids actually made it to adulthood, out of those treacherous um, infancy through toddler years. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was. It, so it would, it would make sense that we were like adapted to be attracted to yeah. sex at a young age and able to reproduce at a young age. So it wouldn't be like the Duggars, nineteen kids and counting, where I mean you just pumping them out. Like you, you would have it of those if you started say at age I don't know sixteen, like this is inferring, um, all the way until like the point where having babies wasn't feasible any longer. And let's say you did have nineteen of those kids. I mean I I don't know what the statistics are, but what, two uh, live. Yeah, two of them make it to adulthood at that point. Well, yeah, so you would have to. It kind of turns into a get it while the getting's good, right? Because, right? yep. yeah. Ironic, too, that the Duggars, one of those dudes, is like a total pedophile. Did you watch that? No, no. I, I need to. Is it on it's, a Prime? Yeah, it's pretty Is it wild. pretty gnarly? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Way, way worse than you think. Super dark and everything, yeah. too? Wow. Yeah, it's way worse than I thought. Well, <laughs> yeah. So everybody check it out, the Duggars. It'll be very uplifting. <laughs> yeah. if, if but to just tell you, man, I'm, I'm a much better person than that dude. So, yeah, well, that, that does matter. So... On, a, on an evolutionary standpoint. Now, now clients will say that. They'll say to you, well, uh, evolutionarily, we're wired for this. So, you know, I, I was just born this way, baby. You know, mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of the approach. So for, for clinicians, when, when that approach is taken, because they will also refer, they went back to the Stone Age for this, but they will also, well, in, you know, Greece and Roman times, you know, having a, having a, a, a child to have sex with was normal and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they will reference that. But on an evolutionary thing, like what's a counter to that? What's Because that's that's one thing I think people would be interested. Um, because it's not necessarily an argument with clients, but it is useful when they're using their mental gymnastics to offer you know some replacement thoughts to them that can kind of work against some of these things. So what might you say to a client? Well, you're, you're queuing up quite nicely the very next clip. Oh but, really? Yeah, yeah. That's literally what they get into. Oh, okay. And yeah. Play, let's play that, and we'll jump right in. Because we'll, we'll we'll answer your question, and then I also have a weird little hypothetical I want to run by you. Okay. Yeah. Let's so, check her out. All right. Contain sexual activities with children. Christianity, Islam, and Judaism are no exception. Mary was at the age of twelve or fifteen when she got her baby, Jesus Christ. Uh, Aisha was uh, married with the prophet uh, at six and consummated the marriage at nine. Furthermore, bar mitzvah is when Jewish boys turn 13 and are seen as men. Jewish girls have bat mitzvah. When they turn 12, they are seen as women. Looking back in history, one can see a sexual pattern. The average age of pregnancy was 13 and only in recent years has that age gone up, especially in Western society. Currently in Western society, the average age of pregnancy is between 21 and 23. When I was uh, 13, this is interview with a woman who has a relationship with an adult when she was 13. Right? Yeah, I might even watch different versions of the yeah, play it. Years old, I fell in love with a guy who was 18. It was love at first sight. Uh, he often came to my house because uh, he was a friend of my brother. Uh, they did some motorcycling and horse riding together. 
Uh, I start to like him more and more because he was uh, a bit older. Uh, he already works. Um, I used to visit uh, his parents uh, where we used to play uh, on the pinball machine. When I put my hands uh, on the button, he used to stand behind me, uh, place his hands over mine and guide me. Uh, he was uh, sweet, cool, uh, a little bit macho. Um, my whole family uh, approved this relationship, uh, except my dad. Uh, one day we were kissing in my room and my dad uh, find out. He began to shout, uh, get out of my house and never come back. My father uh, went to the police to press charges against my boyfriend Willem uh, because I think that uh, he thought that what we did was wrong. I was a child and Willem was an adult and I think that that, that was pedophilia in his eyes. Despite everything I still continued our relationship. Uh, one day there was uh, a party at Willem's uh, house. Uh, his parents invited me. Uh, my dad discovered that and uh, I went there and told uh, me to come home directly. So uh, I went home and I opened the door and there was my uh, father. He was very, very angry. Uh, he had a knife in his hand and he uh, threaded me. I was scared and uh, I ran. I ran for my life. I was so scared that I ran to my neighbor and called his parents. Uh, they came uh, to pick me up and we went to the police. The next day my uh, whole family decided uh, that Willem was never allowed to come to our house again. And uh, despite of everything, I loved him and I don't think that what we did was wrong or pedophilia. He okay, that's your timestamp. Yeah, that's weird. We, uh, <clears throat> this lady wasn't in the version I watched. I'm hmm. wondering if, yeah. So, well, I don't know, we could, should we stop and yeah. start all over? <laughs> uh, see, now, now play, play here. Let's. Okay. Um, let's see this. And uh, consequently also finished the puberty somewhat later. Western society has chosen 18 as the legal age at which we become adults. Despite the fact that women usually reach maturity at age 16, the legal age for Western society is 18. This was an obvious choice because at 18, men reach maturity. To fully understand this choice, we must understand the evolutionary differences between men and women. Women have many requirements for their ideal man. One of the most valued requirements is that their ideal man is tall. This is not a superficial choice. Instead, this is actually a logical and instinctive decision. Back in the Stone Age, a simple law applied. Survival of the fittest. This meant that only the strongest humans survived. Women preferred men who were big and tall. Larger men could provide more food and better protection than smaller weaker men. Natural selection favored bigger men. That is why most men are taller than women. But this extended growth came at a price. In order to become taller than women, men needed two years extra to grow taller. The extra energy put into growing also affected men's mental growth. Instead of becoming physically mature at age 16, men are physically mature at age 18 and are also later in their mental maturity. Today, if you compare 16-year-old girls to boys, you will realize that 16-year-old girls are sexually and mentally far more mature 
than 16 year old boys. Girls even start puberty earlier than boys and therefore usually have sex earlier. That is why girls are more likely to want older partners. Growing up they realize that boys their own age lag behind in maturity and keep this mindset. That is why the average woman is younger than a male partner. Biologically humans start experimenting with sexual intercourse in puberty. This usually begins around the age of 13. However, Western society has pushed the legal age of sexual maturity several years beyond the physical age of sexual maturity and regards sex normal when humans reach the legal age of 18. This choice is not based on morals. Instead, this choice is mainly based on education. Western society is fortunate enough to offer most children an education. High school education usually ends at 18. That is why Western society does not favor underage sex because it interferes with education. Due to the increased education, the age of pregnancy has risen in recent years. But despite the high pregnancy age and the modern ways of thinking, Western society still has a deep fascination with underaged girls and nowhere is this more visible than in the fashion industry and the media. Okay, awesome. That's, that's what I was wanting to get to. And so it, it because we don't have the, the, the need to reproduce at such a young age, our, we've, we've adapted culturally. Mm -hmm. Uh, such that there's maybe higher ideals, things that can be, you know, like e like education, you know, being able to expand a bit as a human being uh, rather than reproduce at a young age. And, and so it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like collectively we've decided that, you know, if, if, if childbearing can be offset until into the adult years, the, the overall quality of the woman's life and maybe even therefore the child's life is going to be better because the, the, the foundation's a little stronger. The, mm -hmm. the woman is now a woman, not a, not a child, and, mm -hmm. and it maybe it's just overall healthier. In fact, we have the luxury, it's a luxury of uh, modern Western society that uh, reproduction can be put off a little bit to but, a little bit older. But in other words, like 18, as they were describing in that, like according to this guy is just kind of arbitrary just it, it's not really linked with a lot of development um or maturity it's just it's <laughs> which kind of makes sense i mean you if you want a uh, a functioning society you want people who are contributing to that society right and uh finishing primary education would be essential for for having contributing members to society like they, they have value uh, they're able to, to uh, show that value with the work that they're doing and then they're able to receive value back because of the way everybody kind of benefits from that. If I mean, if you have a bunch of dummies, you know, having kids all over the place, then, and, and no offense against anybody who's had kids younger than, I'm not calling you dummies, I'm saying dumb because you didn't get education. Um, and, and uh, but that kind of makes sense in its own in its own way. Um, yeah. And so the, 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 the adulthood number of 18 which I, I think some people have always thought it was a little arbitrary anyway mm -hmm. like questions are always asked like, well wait a minute i can die for my country when i'm 18 but i can't buy a six pack of beer you know mm -hmm. isn't that a little weird i'm like eh, yeah that's a weird discrepancy a weird. or or same thing with like cigarettes and stuff like that so um i mean i don't know if he has a point i i think that he's highlighting something that that I, you know i think it's what you're saying dude mm -hmm. uh, and there's nothing magical about the age 18 but it, that does happen to align with at least in the u.s with the way our education system set up and it it benefits the culture the society as a whole to have a more educated populace uh contributing and and putting back mm -hmm. and so th this is where i like a weird thing i was thinking of actually just on the way down here and so you know we're, if we're recognizing that like the fit like physical sexual development is like based on like evolved you know traits you know through natural selection and sexual selection mm -hmm. you know kind of the idea being that you know like natural selection is you know the an organism is more likely to survive and pass on its genes the better it can adapt to the environment and so the traits that make the 
organisms survive are more likely to be passed down than the the traits that get killed off because they're not adaptive Mm -hmm. and and so like a lot of and then like sexual selection is a lot of the things that we find sexually attractive in each other males and females it was highlighting in the using the the bright flashing lights that are strategically placed you know (laughs) those types of things signal sexual um or i guess reproductive capacity right right and and so like we've evolved as an organism to reproduce at a young age but then like evolution also works with culture and society Mm -hmm. and that like some cultural norms some values based on the environment are more adaptive and mm-hmm. therefore get passed on. Like the golden rule mm-hmm. is a trait that mm-hmm. seems to be pretty universally beneficial. The silver sure. rule, same thing. Sure. And and so like as of right now in the industrialized society that we're in, in the the modern age, um, we like that we we've decided it's kind of become a, an, an idea, a concept that sex can wait until it's eighteen. We have that luxury. And that's an adaptive trait. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, educated people reproduce, better living circumstances, more education, uh, technology progresses, society progresses. So here's the thing, man. I was thinking, like, with World War III potentially on the the precipice. Hell yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Sweet. Yeah. So I don't know. I I think it might be an Einstein quote. Uh, Probably, again, I'll look dumb on this, but. You said something like, I don't know what weapons World War Three will be fought with, but I know that World War Four will be fought with sticks and stones. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dark, Because we'll right? destroy ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So I'm imagining like a Terminator 2, you know when Skynet, go, Skynet goes live yeah. and it shows like this post-apocalyptic future? Yeah. So I mean like, what if, dude, what if we're headed towards that? That happens, right? The power grid gets wiped out. Internet goes down. All all of our data is lost. That like everything goes completely dark ages and mm-hmm. like taken over by Chat GPT. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chat GPT goes live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. So he, th- this is what I was thinking. Is like if you and I are still alive, like we're still going to hold that same value that like, Oh yeah. 18 is a good age of consent. Even though the world's crumbled, it's like, yeah, that's still an age of consent. But how long that will end up not being an adaptive trait. That won't be adaptive to have that value anymore. And I, this is what I wonder is if, so if, if the environment changes, Mm -hmm. would then the values shift back to what they were for the most of human civilization? Would, would the age of consent drop if, if technology is wiped and it becomes adaptive to reproduce? Well, of course, because then, then, uh, you know, uh, you, you along with that, you'd see a dramatic downturn in the population of the of the world at that point, Big and time. then and then the natural uh, drive to survive and procreate would would kick in. I'd say in the meantime, though, you would see a, a total abandon abandonment of morals. Um, like, have you ever seen that movie, The Road? No. With uh, I've seen Mad Max. It's close, not really though. But like, it, it's basically I can't remember the. Uh, Ving, wait, no, no, not Ving Rains. Um, Viggo Mortensen. Uh, Viggo Mortensen. Yeah, Vin, <laughs> well, both those guys are in it, too. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. It's Viggo Mortensen. It, it, no, it's Ving Rains playing Viggo Mortensen as Vin Diesel. He's, <laughs> He's an the best actor, actor ever. <laughs> He's an amazing actor. You can imitate how an actor is, is <laughs> looks. <acts>. Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, basically the world ends. They don't really tell you why the world ends. It's kind of um, ambiguous, but it's uh, irrelevant. But they, they, uh, it's him and his son, and his son's really young. And um, he's he he knows he's dying the entire time, uh, you know. But um, he's protecting his son, and everybody is maniacs. Like he, he talks about his son. His son's super young, and he talks about like, well, you know, there's, there's like dudes walking the street, marauders with guns, you know, or whatever. And the whole place is trashed, you know. So mm. there's obviously like bombs that have gone off and everything. And you know, he, at one point he talks to his son and says. Well, you know, if, if I don't kill them, then they'll kill me, and then they'll take you and rape you and then eventually kill you, you know, all this other stuff, which is totally true. I, I think you'd see an immediate, like, once once all bets were off, like, you'd see people turn into animals, you know. I think that would be the immediate piece of it. So, yeah. yes, very quickly, 
you'd see an abandonment of morals. There'd be some of us, like you and I, well, ideally. Because we're so virtuous. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah, we would be up trying to uphold that. We'd get killed. But um, <laughs> yeah. but eventually, you know, it would, and, and then it would turn into, after a very long period of time, yes, hey, everybody, we can't keep going like this because we're all going to be dead. Why don't we, you know, establish some rules and some people who, you know, that which is kind of how everything developed in the first yeah. place. But I think at base level, though, one thing this is, is like, you look at this and say, well, yeah, if I think somebody was looking at this, that you can, and I've talked about this before, think about like, um, you've worked with both male and female clients, right? Mm -hmm. And you dig females, yeah? Sure. Okay. And have you, have you worked with uh, female clients that are attractive? Yes. Okay, and it's not as if you develop a relationship with them, right? Right. So I, see, I think to simply acknowledge somebody that's attractive doesn't necessarily mean now you're going to go into an area where it's going to get inappropriate or unprofessional. You just simply acknowledge that person's attractive, right? Mm -hmm. Like I can acknowledge Mila Kunis is attractive, but also realize I don't have a chance in hell yeah. ever. Right? And you could probably control yourself when you're around her. Maybe not. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but now, now look. It, it's. It, I don't tell myself a story that oh my client's attractive and I don't have a chance in hell. That's not what I tell myself. I just say eh, it's inappropriate. And if my if my career means anything or my or my uh, integrity my, right or or my profession means anything that that's something that you ought to not do. Okay, but then but then also I think that same rule applies to uh, according to this that once a girl turns sixteen and now she's she's developed and the the parts of her body that are signaling. To who to men who would be interested in her like that that now she's capable of reproducing. If you were to find that attractive, it doesn't make you a creep. It doesn't now make you a pedophile. Mm. It's simply mm. your biology linking with that biology, saying, "Well, so that seems like that would be appropriate." Now we all know that that's inappropriate legally, right? And and we can have some morals around that, which morals you know are are kind of relative to the individual, and they can just say, "Well, yeah, yeah." I mean. Yes, that's an attractive person, but she's 16, so I'm not going to engage in that behavior. I think I, I think for people like uh, you know, I had one guy. He's like, oh, no, I would never think a 16 year old's attractive. I'm like, really, dude? Like that doesn't make any sense. And, and I showed him, of course, that you showed picture. him his PSI. Yeah, I showed him. No. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, of course, yeah. But then I showed him. Uh, There's a picture of that. Uh, I don't know if you remember a long time ago. She was 16, and she. She hooked up with a dude from Lost. He was some. Uh, she was really young, but dude, she looked in her mid twenties. You mm. know the way she made herself up. And he's like, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, she's hot." And I'm like, "Dude, that girl's sixteen right there." He's like, "Oh, that, she's tricking me." And I'm like, "No, no, no, dude, it, it's tricking." I was like, "No, these things, according to this, and I think what we have is pretty good research to say that that's relatively normal to show that." Yeah, absolutely. So now there's a there's a problem with this because in this next clip, one of the things that that you're putting on here is that popular culture culture kind of sexualizes 16 year olds yeah um and uh when you look at like our developed country compared to traditional cultures and then we they talk about lollycon you know um but so let's get into this next clip i i, I bet the time's off on it i fast forward a little bit okay is this kind of where let's see Percent of teenagers admit to sending naked photos of themselves to other teens. I was around 11 when I started thinking about sex. Uh, and teens and preteens are engaging in sexual behavior at much earlier ages. What? Uh, between the age of five and seven years. I was seven years old. The age of uh, eight. I was eight or nine years old. At the age of 11. At the age of 11. About 12, 13 years. I was 11 or 12 when I first started thinking about sex. Well, I guess all the, you know, everybody gasps when they hear the 13 year old say they're having sex with the 12 year olds but I, I guess we have removed ourselves from what the world was like when we were coming up at age 16 most girls are physically mature however that does not mean that they're mentally ready to have sex and of course all sex should be consensual child sexuality is very prominent in Western media the age of 16 is embedded in our society because at that age every man knows that females are sexually mature. We do not need biology to tell us that 16 year olds are portrayed in the media as sexual beings. Just look at MTV, 16 and pregnant, teen moms or my super sweet 16 or the fact that the average age of a fashion model is 16.
Western society considers this behavior normal. If a girl wants to start her high fashion modeling career at age 19, I think that's a little bit too old for most modeling agencies. However, not every culture has adopted the Western views on child sexuality. Traditional cultures, which have had very little contact with Western ideology, still marry and bear children in early puberty. There are also many modern societies that differ from the West. In Japanese society, the attraction to young teenage girls is a widespread cultural phenomenon. The term lolicon describes an attraction to underage girls or individuals with such an attraction. Lolicon is very popular in Japanese media and fashion. Outside Japan, lolicon mainly refers to a genre of Japanese comics and animations that depict girls sexually. What makes lolicon so controversial are the art forms, anime and manga. Lolicon art has no actual age, just like the Disney characters Peter Pan and Tinkerbell. Nobody knows their real age. The attraction to children can be found in many societies, but there is a limit. There is no society in the world that encourages sex with children. Okay. God, you, you and I had a client in common that was quiet into Sailor Moon. Oh my god, you know? yeah, yeah. And, yeah, that, so, yeah, that there is kind of a, I don't know, a mixed message right mm -hmm. there that we just kind of pointed out. You know, I, we just got through talking about the value of 18, mm -hmm. arbitrary as it is, and then, I mean, it, so I was a junior in high school when Hit Me Baby One More Time came out, and... I mean, I fell in love with Britney. Oh, yeah. And Who didn't? Yeah, right. Have you noticed one thing about Britney, too? Like, anybody who's a big fan of her always says Britney's back. And I'm like, I, well, I don't know where she went. Yeah, she's been around. But, but, I, <laughs> <laughs> but, but then, like, three years later, oh, Britney's back. I'm like, well, how many times can you yeah, leave yeah. and come back? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and. I just don't hear that with other artists. Like, Britney's back, bitch. I'm like, yeah. oh, uh, okay. Yeah, you gotta add bitch to it, like, don't you? Yeah, I was like, Britney, bitch. I didn't know, I, I didn't know she left, yeah. but okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but no, that was a, man, that was a sweet video. That and uh, Genie in a Bottle. Uh, Christina Aguilera. Come on, son. Yeah, remember that Ma Maxim magazine? Yeah. I like, remember that. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah that was, that was the, and the, they were young. That They had to be in their like the, late teens at that point, they, right? They were, yeah. They, yeah. They, they, those girls are our age. Yeah. But like very the, sexualized in, in that time. Dudes our age now liked them. Oh, they, for sure. Yeah. For sure. So like I guess I guess I mean, and this is something that I think our clients point out mm -hmm. is kind of this, you know, it's it's like endorsed but kept secret and then kind of a push pull, push pull with the messaging that mm -hmm. we send. And I mean that is that is accurate, and I guess it just means that finding that the I don't know is the is the is the message to find a higher moral virtue in understanding that okay although she's a genie in a bottle and is saying to rub her the right way that maybe I abstain <laughs> from doing so you know no uh, I, I, I <laughs> what think, do you say well uh, there's a pretty good quote on on morals and we went over it in morals dilemma I don't I don't have the quote sitting in front of me but it's, it's something to the effect of morals is more about conformity than it is about like virtue um, meaning that that well okay so I can have my individual morals um, but but also there's going to be laws and my conformity to those laws really will kind of dictate freedoms in my life and so what I, what I think it boils down to is uh, not not so much morals but values what I find to be important right um, because yes it, it if you were recognized if say you know a value I don't know what the value would be maybe just uh, you know sexual pleasure that can be a value sure I find that to be very important right somebody might find that to be very important okay. um, but then where does that value rank, right? Does that value rank above your freedom? Sure. And and if That's that good. value ranks above your freedom, well, then in your mind, well, then, yeah, you probably will act on that at the potential expense of your freedom. 
provided that you were you were exposed and otherwise arrested and prosecuted and convicted and so on and so forth. But um, I, I think most of us don't do that. I think we recognize well our, our freedom comes is is pretty high up there because without it, um, very other very few things can can be had outside of that. We we might put like a relationship with our spouse or relationship with our children above that and that would go that would lend to like maybe one of those moral dilemmas like if your loved one was dying from some disease and and you had to go to the pharmacy and they had the the cure but you didn't have the money to pay for it would you steal it right um yeah at that point you might say well my freedom is worth less than that person's life and so for sure, yeah. I will. I will take the chance of, of losing my freedom to save them. So again, that gets really weird. So morals, morals get really tricky. That's why I, I constantly encourage clients: don't think about morals so much as think about your values, because your morals uh, sometimes those are very emotional based too. And and you know you shouldn't be making emotional based decisions anyway. And and um, they're not necessarily conforming to what the current like legal expectations and norms of our society are. And one way or another, you need to adapt, or you're going to sacrifice those freedoms. So it's up to you at that point. So it's kind of like your take on working with dark triad clients, and that if you can get the client to ask themselves, based on the lifestyle that I want to live, is it in my best interest right now to act on this? Is, right. Is it worth my freedom? Right. Yeah. And and for them, if they're more <clears throat> important, then then they are they are finding maybe some some value in their importance as well if I maybe if I have sex with this person that gives me status that gives me pride that gives me you know but but there's other avenues of accomplishing that such that it's not going to sacrifice your freedom those are the kind of lessons they need to learn at that point perfect so um, want to jump to one of your clips well this next piece I, this is important I thought this kind of goes over definitions <clears throat> of pedophilia and also oh, that was like sub definitions too that I think are really important and then we'll jump into some of my clips sweet so we'll start here. What is pedophilia? There is a difference between the general public term of pedophilia and the professional definition. The public usually associates pedophilia with someone who is sexually attracted to a human being below the legal age of the majority. However, the clinical term specifies the definition as sexual preference for children, usually of pre-pubertal or early pubertal age and that for six months or more that person has acted on these urges or suffers from distress as a result of having these feelings. The individual must also be at least 16 years of age and at least five years older than the juvenile involved to meet criteria for pedophilia. Pedophiles can be divided into two main categories, exclusive pedophiles and non-exclusive pedophiles. Exclusive pedophiles are only attracted to children and non-exclusive pedophiles are attracted to children and adults. Exclusive pedophiles are sometimes referred to as true pedophiles. They are only attracted to children. Pedophiles are usually attracted to a particular age range. If the child is younger than four years, it is called infantophilia usually zero to three years on average. If the child is prepubertal or early pubertal, it is called pedophilia, 13 and younger on average. If the child is adolescent, it is called hebophilia, roughly 12 to 16 years. Even though there are differences between the sexual attraction to minors, only one term is mainly used by the media, the word pedophilia. Professionally, there's... Yeah, that's good enough. So, the, I guess the basic thing there, as we're looking at this, is like, um, in terms of accuracy, I think that's important. It's, but it's not just semantics. Like, you want, really want to identify um, the age ranges um, for, for attraction pieces, because it's going to help you on the clinical side. But also for my clients, like my client, I had one client, um, he's a very eccentric dude, um, but he he would not, you know, get on board with this pedophilia thing, which he, his, his victim was um, in somewhere close to 17, so very much in the hebophile range. 
But when I t- once I kind of educated him on that, he was totally on board with it. He's like, oh, okay, I guess I'm a hebefly. I'm like, well, that's, that's not what I was trying to get at, dude. But, yeah, okay, I mean, whatever you say. So, I mean, that it, that is uh, not not important. I think it is right. kind of important <clears throat> that we that we keep the definitions solid and understand a little bit I about that. I think most people aren't, that <coughs> aren't in our field probably have never even heard those terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so this next piece, this is this is um, the they kind of talk a little bit about female pedophiles, which I think is important because, um, you know, male versus female, I think it's looked at very differently. Um, and it'll, it'll kind of highlight why this is the case um, and why somebody might not really consider this to be a big deal if, if it was a female mm. engaging in, in these behaviors. So uh, let's fir- hear this first part. This is from our old pal uh, Matt Lauer, he's he's kind of an expert on uh, appropriate sexual relations. Yeah, he's pretty so, glib too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> glib. <laughs> Freaking <laughs> Matt, Matt Lauer. <laughs> oh my goodness. So let me let me cue this up here <clears throat> and. All right. Teachers, your first thought might be good. I hope you learned something. But the parents of one 14-year-old in Florida were not happy about what their son was learning from a teacher in his school. Her name was Deborah Lefebvre, and she's one in a string of young female teachers who've admitted having sex with underage male students. I don't believe that female pedophiles exist because um, women have a less uh, aggressive sex drive. Does society treat this differently? I mean, if this was a man doing this to a boy or a man doing this to a, a girl, um, would it be thought of in the same way? I mean, would the word relationship even be used? That's right. I mean, sometimes I get confused. You know, is it a crime story? Is it a love story? Uh, was it a, was it consensual? Was it a rape? You know, all of that seems to be, you know, fodder for, for discussion. We really don't know. I think female pedophiles exist because you have the classic stories of uh, high school teachers that are having an affair with boy students. 39-year-old Ann Knopf denied allegations that she had sex with her daughter's ex in the basement of her home while her husband and children slept upstairs. You, you would have maybe fantasies of you doing it with some hot soccer mom who was way older than you because you know she's fully developed and you'd be like, oh yeah, I'd hit that. Females are generally not associated with pedophilia in the eyes of modern society. Women are seen as nurturing and caring and would never harm children. If a man hugs a strange child, people would generally think he is a pervert. But if a woman hugs a strange child, people would think she is kind and even nurtures children that are not her own. There is a clear double standard when it comes to pedophilia between men and women. This double standard has allowed many offending female pedophiles to go undetected. Roughly 80% of the victims of female pedophiles are not believed. Furthermore, boys are less likely to report sexual abuse. The media mainly talks about female high school teachers when it comes to female pedophilia. However, high school teachers who have sexual activities with teenagers are not pedophiles. If the child is in puberty, it is called habophilia. This means that most high school teachers who have sex with children are offending habophiles. So on that front, I mean, <clears throat> that intuitively is totally true, right? Like, I mean, if you if you were to ask any normal, like, I don't know what normal is, but. <laughs> just a dude you know and you showed him some of the images of those teachers that were on there like and guys are weird about it like guys guys react very differently about these things um in 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 this you know sometimes maybe even the same night based on the news stories they might see a teacher who's you know attractive and they might ask the question well where the hell was she when i was 16 it's always a statement isn't it right right very very similar um but then if we have uh, you know, same age difference, um, you know, and, but the teacher's a male, um, on all sides, everybody's like, man, what a creep piece of crap, you know what I mean, yeah, like that, yeah. and, um, so, so, there's a bit of a double standard, isn't there? Yeah, and 
it, well, I think it's. Be, I mean, these are broad generalizations and broad categories. Sure. But I I think that people will look at the teenage boy, the you know the after effect, and they're going to look at it and the 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 trauma manifests differently, and that the teenage boy might not be feeling the same you know, maybe fear or the the hesitation to get involved in relationships um but it might instead give them maybe a cavalier attitude towards authority within a sexual relationship or you know kind of send them the wrong message about power and control when it comes to sex and so mm -hmm. I, I think if you know if painting in broad brush strokes people look at you know the the young girl that gets sexually victimized by the male perpetrator is you know having the traditional symptoms of trauma whereas the the male is looked at as you know high-fiving with his friends and then is therefore excused mm -hmm. societally and I, I think it's I, I think that people just need to maybe expand their understanding of some of the negative outcomes of of sexual abuse and that it's it doesn't always manifest in as like you know tears and fear it's uh comes out in other ways through like maybe screwed up understanding of again power and control and uh, well, well does that does that then does that then lend to this idea um of the, the guys the only first of all that only men are capable because you know only men are, are capable of this but then in, in addition to that that th there's hyper attention paid to men Right, like so. So, if a female is being nurturing and caring and stuff like that, it's kind of like I mean, here, here's what I'd say is: since there have been teachers, there, there have been teachers having sex with kids, right? Like, it's not like there's something in the water now. Mm -hmm. I, I'd say um, it's probably more. Um, we're paying more attention to it now. Um, it, it's come to the forefront because of some of these cases, but it, it's it's always been happening. It has to have always been happening. But but some of those behaviors that you would see from a female teacher might be I, I guess just a little um, not as not as uh, obvious right like you just wouldn't see it because that that's just how girls are kind of expect that nurturing caring loving stuff like that whereas if a dude act like that um, it's looked at as weird it's like the, grooming, the grooming goes undetected right 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 that's where I'm, I'm kind of wondering there's a there's a part here on on how this um, how this turns into like how men are viewed about these things be, and uh this is re really good from uh bill bird does a good job introducing this so let's see what he has to say on them let me tell you something man you know what i'm sick of pedophiles <laughs> yeah sex offenders dude they're on every channel everybody is doing something on sex offenders, you know, it's like, dude, I got it. There's people out there touching kids, you know? But it's not everybody. It's a very small portion of the population. So, you know, take it down a few, because you're making it awkward out there. Dude, you can't say hi to kids anymore. I love kids. I love kids. I like making faces at them on the airplane, making them laugh. Now parents are like, is that a sex offender? They start huddling their kids in making me feel like a freak, you know? I'm terrified of kids now. The continuous attention from the media uh, to pedophilia uh, that makes you uh, suspicious, suspicious uh, when you see a man. So the number of male teachers in our primary schools has fallen to just one in eight. Does it matter? Well, there is increasing evidence that young children are not seeing enough male role models in schools. And some fear men are being frightened of. Yeah, I do think there is a, a different perception of men compared to women in public places. Depending on how they look, if they're with or without children, they will be looked at in a different way than a single female sitting alone in a park, rather than if it was a male. I get a few funny looks. Some educational experts believe schools are too feminized nowadays. Methodical working and attentiveness have been encouraged at the expense of competition and leadership, the things boys respond best to. What do you think? I mean, do they have any merit with that argument? Specifically what? Like, that the, the guys are just afraid to enter workforces that are predominantly female or have access to children um, because of how they're looked. Or guys now act differently around children as a result of 
uh, being viewed this way? Well, I don't know, because I like I was thinking about that for myself, and I think I'm I'm so like hyper focused on it that like I I remember when my nieces and nephews were first born, like almost making a point of going out of my way to mm-hmm. like I don't I don't want my in laws to think that anything weird and so I I remember myself being like leery about you know my niece might want me to you know go upstairs and read a story to her or something and it was always like hey uh point to another hey you want to come with there's three of us you oh know? you have a third yeah yeah have like, a third. Where, we exactly. used to, where we used to work yeah yeah yep, having a third yeah so like I I felt I could speak for myself like conscious of perception mm-hmm you know, I'm a, I don't know, I mean, I don't even want to put out that, I, I don't want people to even have to, like, think about it or worry, and maybe mm-hmm. that's, maybe I'm too, you know, knee deep in this field, you know, I'm getting, you know. So, so what happens, like, you find a, you're in the grocery store shopping, and uh, you're picking out some relish, <laughs> and a little kid comes up behind you and pulls on your on your uh, on your you know in the, uh, on your the back of your shirt and says, uh, "I can't find my mommy." What do you what do you do? Punch the kid and run? Yeah, the, no, front kick the kid and then run. <laughs> it's like Spartan kick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this I'll, is yeah. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously I'd help him find his parents, but but like it, it would be on my mind though. Be like, man, I'm a stranger. I'm I'd be worried that as I'm walking around with this kid, like. Yeah. Oh God! If the parent, if the parents see me, I need to make sure that they know I'm trying to help the kids find their parents. I don't, I don't need some dude blasting me with a right hook as I'm trying to take little Johnny around the corner. Yeah, know? no, that would be okay. Is that paranoid? I mean, I don't know. No, I mean, <clears throat> I think it's, I think it's just be mindful of, of where the culture is, and and I think of how men, you know, adult. Okay, what if one of your nieces were in the store and they got lost and you saw some dude um, walking down the aisle with her holding her hand? Immediately suspicious, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So, um, but I think I think you know you can do that without having any sus- actual malice or suspicious behavior associated with what you're doing. You know what I mean? And I think take that in stride. Like I would, of course, never walk away from a kid. You know. Um, but I would say, like, sometimes I'll be driving and I'll see, I don't know, it's like raining out. And I'll see somebody, some little kid walking and I feel really bad for him. I'm like, nope. I just right, keep driving. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sucks even though, you, kid. even though I would genuinely like say, oh, hey, do you want to ride? And I'd just give him a ride. But that would not, I feel like that'd be completely inappropriate. Cannot do and it. I'd want the kid, if it was my kid, to say no and just deal with the heartache of walking through that storm. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So a lot of people might ask, okay, well, what do you what do you do for treatment of this? Um, and um, there's there's a part on this, and we'll kind of segue in this into the the future of this. So this will be uh, probably our last clip here, and then we'll wrap up. But um, I wanted to get into this because people are very curious about this concept, and and what is it that you do working with these people. <laughs> There is no cure for pedophilia. You can't change the deviant sexual preference. What you can do is two things. One, you can intervene at the level of the sex drive. So there are pharmacological agents that really decrease the libido of the person. So that means you stop their sexual activity completely also called chemical uh, castration. That's one option, but this type of treatment has many harmful side effects. Uh, You can think about osteoporosis, I mean serious osteoporosis, depression, feminization. So in the long term, this type of treatment is not an option. Uh, The second possibility is uh, psychological treatment. That means you work on uh, the psychological problems that actually make the person act out their pedophilic interests. So you can think about maybe the person has the idea that it's okay uh, to have sex with children, uh, that children um, are not harmed by it, that uh, they actually may 
benefit from. Stop thoughts, emotions, behaviors. What modality would that be? That looks a lot like octopus therapy. Yeah. Okay, continuing. Okay. It's a kind of sex education. Well, these types of cognitive oh, uh, oh, no need to no. be diminished, oh, need to be reduced in treatment. Also, a lot of pedophiles lack empathy, lack insight into what their behavior does to the children. So I'm talking here, of course, about... What's the dental plans in other countries, they by don't the care. way? They Holy don't care. hell, They dude. don't care about teeth, bro. <laughs> Pedophiles who act on their uh, sexual preference. These types of treatments are necessary and are generally quite effective in reducing the risk of a pedophile again abusing children. Oh, those CBT's effective? Weird. I'm just kidding. She was a lovely lady, by the way. Yeah. She's speaking truth. Okay. The future of pedophilia. This is kind of a cool part that we'll wrap here. I don't think that pedophilia will become accepted because, uh, like I said, the public associate pedophilia with active sexual relationships between adults and children and condemn this. So I don't think it will be accepted. Yes, I think ultimately pedophilia will, will be accepted. Um, maybe it'll take, you know, a hundred more years. Uh, yeah, it's just like homosexuality in the DSM-2 uh, that came out it's in the 1950s. Like homosexuality was uh, was yeah, yeah. Was, like listed as a mental disorder well it's not anymore and I think yeah it can happen that feels like a really illogical approach to I the don't argument. like that part like homosexuality was in the was in the DSM form be as a result of that like then all of a sudden but like homosexual behavior by nature is not illegal right you know or what I mean or, or harmful yeah, or yeah, anything yeah, yeah, that's what that, I don't like that okay but <laughs> that, uh, we can consider this sexual preference as a natural variation and of course we still will need to uh, make sure that a pedophile doesn't act on those sexual preferences but I think the the fact that the person has a preference I think we will arrive uh, at a point in time where that's just a given, considered a given. So at one hand I think that pedophilia will never be accepted because it involves damage of children. <laughs> Dick Swab. But we should also <laughs> remember Dick that um, many of the of people who sad. are focusing uh, uh, sexual orientation towards children um, can keep their impulses in such a way that they don't damage children. Man, can you imagine the terror that guy got as a kid? He had, no he, choice. Was... he had no choice but to become an academic. Man. I know, yeah. I know. Well, so what do you think about that? Like, I, I, um, I, I think what she was saying, I think, is already kind of a given in our field. Like, yes, I understand it's a preference that you have. I mean, but I'm not going to acknowledge that as a valid preference. I mean, pr provide particularly if you, and I, and I don't want to acknowledge it like it's an orientation or anything like that on par with something like homosexuality. I just don't, I mean, to me, validating it to that degree normalizes it in a way that almost endorses and or condones it. And then it's almost like, well, but for these weird laws we have, you could do whatever you want. And I'm like, I don't know if that's a wise approach um, because yeah, I, I, I don't think any type of endorsement or condoning of that behavior is very, is very like, and that's not really a therapist's job to affirm that anyway, like validate that. Like I, I can validate and affirm that yes, this person experiences these attractions towards this, but I'm not, I'm not doing that as, oh, oh yeah, that's, that's a totally uh, uh, valid way of living your life or anything like that. That's not, that's not Man. my obligation. You know what I mean? Right. In, you know, like it's almost, I don't know. It's like that almost sounded prescriptive rather than descriptive. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think it's okay to acknowledge because look, I, I've had dudes that are pedophiles that 
have like broken down crying in my office, cursing that they have this attraction. They didn't choose it. They don't want it. They hate that they have it. They want more than anything to get rid of it. They, and then, you know, then and they, they hate themselves. They think they're a loser. They think they're garbage. They think they're a monster. And so as a therapist, that's a, that's a complex thing to deal with. And mm-hmm. so I'll affirm, this is what I will affirm. I'll affirm that they, in fact, didn't choose to make, you know, their lives exponentially harder by being attracted to kids and thereby, you know, putting themselves into this weird conundrum to where... Sure. And they didn't choose that. I'll affirm that. And then my job's to help them get their feet back underneath them, get them uh, feeling good about themselves, but not, but not to affirm that as an endorsement of acting on it it's Mm -hmm. it it has to be it's non-negotiable there is there is no acting on it it's 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 unfortunate Mm -hmm. that they have that arousal Mm -hmm. that sucks that would be tough and it's it's the cards they're dealt they they might have a they're gonna have a hell of a time changing it but it's like we have to be able to build these clients up to the point that they develop a life that they love enough to not act on something as profoundly strong as a sexual impulse. Right, and I think even, so obviously we wouldn't endorse any manifestation of the behavior that would result in them like having sexual relations with a child. Absolutely right? not. But, but I also think it's important to not have any endorsement of like pseudo manifestations either. You know, like virtual reality people have talked about that and I'm like I've well been, I've been on that kick for a while I, I don't know how I don't know how intelligent that is because maybe maybe um, you, you have a and, and obviously <clears throat> there's no statistics and I don't know if I want to find out how do you this. even research that dude? right so you have a, a group of guys who are virtually watching this or there's animated characters that are generated you know through AI or, or whatever that look very real um, and they're watching it for purposes. It, 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 there's be one reason, one reason alone why they would watch that, and that's masturbatory like reinforcement, right? That's why they're watching it. Um, that to me sounds like pseudo manifestation of the behaviors. Like you're still kind of skirting the edge. And then I would wonder, well, then how much does that you know scratch that itch that then moves them into the actualized behaviors where they're actually you know uh, there's there's contact. And if anybody would be part of that. How on earth would you get there? Like, that, how on earth could you could you it, it, that behavior? So, I think, like you said, a hard line has to be drawn it, because if not, then then that, where do you go from there? You know, where does the line be drawn? So, but according to this, one thing I would say is um, I agree with that idea that your your sexual arousal and your sexual attraction um, doesn't change over time; it expands. So. Yes, I, I can acknowledge that, I, I don't know, roughly 13 years old, I was a, attracted to other 13-year-olds. But through reinforcement, as I was growing up, um, peer reinforcement, I found other girls attractive. You know, And now, like, I mean, can you, can, I mean, we're both in our 40s. Can you imagine, like, hooking up with a 19-year-old? You know it's what I mean? Like, it, it's not even appealing, you know, for yeah. a variety of other reasons other than what right. they look like. That, right. that almost has nothing to do with it, right? Right. Um, but... They wouldn't even get my Ninja Turtles references, you know? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and don't get me wrong, it, like, it, it doesn't mean that I can't look at an 18, 19, 25-year-old and acknowledge that they are attractive, but that doesn't mean now I want to move into, oh, I need to try to set up a sexual relationship with them. Like, that that's where it starts to become, I mean, because, because there's a lot of other um, real life and social implications that come along with that, and, and not to mention a violation of our values, too. So that's where I, I think that, the, the message here through CBT, you know, you can really work on helping clients get to the point where they can expand their arousal and their sexual interests and just start becoming more interested in adult oriented sexual activities with right. peers their same age, you know, for whatever reason, they were just never reinforced on that level. Boost their social skills, help them get comfortable talking to people their own age. Yeah. yeah. Because I would never, it's my obligation at times to make sure like I would never act in 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 a way that would be in the bet, worst interest for my clients, right? And no matter what they say, if I affirm that behavior, I, I'm now acting in their best interest or their worst interest because I'm I'm endorsing and affirming and validating a behavior that will eventually lead to the loss of their freedom, which is not good for any of our clients. That's the great way of looking at it, right? And and you can get into this debate of well, we should change. None of that's ever going to happen. We're never going to change laws about this. Nobody's ever going to. Tell me a politician 
I'm bored with that. Like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna start lowering the age of, of consent in there. It's never gonna happen. Like, can you ever see that? Where's Definitely Ron, not in our lifetime. Where's Ron Book at? <laughs> right, exactly. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. Come so, out of the woodwork. So I, I think for clinicians that are working with this, yes, like you said, affirm the fact that they are experiencing this. You don't want to invalidate that they aren't that they, they do have these arousal patterns. You want to validate that. Um, that it's not necessarily their choice. And that they may not necessarily want that in their lives, but also work towards the idea that, you know, uh, there's not much traction beyond that validation that you can give them and working on new healthy relationships that are adult oriented and non-harmful is probably our best route and combating the other stuff with CBT, not octopus therapy, like I said earlier. So... Touche. That's a good enough place to end, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and then, provided that I don't die, we should be ready to rock and roll. Hey, Gorilla Social Workers, wish Mr. Warren here luck on his Ironman. One hundred forty point six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Two point four mile swim, one hundred twelve mile bike, and then a twenty six point mile, twenty six point two mile run. So way over two hundred pounds. You're doing all that. Yeah, well, not way over. I'm like, well, no, you you weigh over, not oh, yeah, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Well, we'll see you guys maybe on the <laughs> yeah. next episode. Might just be me. <laughs>